Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public. Welcome to tonight's public science presentation, Beyond the Genome, Epigenetics Revealed, with Dr. Mary Gehring. Dr. Gehring is a member of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research and also an assistant professor of biology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She received her PhD in plant biology from the University of California, Berkeley in 2005 and then was a postdoctoral researcher at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center until she joined the Whitehead Institute in 2010. In 2011, she was named the Cabot Career Development Professor by MIT. Dr. Gehring's research happens to represent one of the most exciting areas today in recent genetic uh, science. As scientists have penetrated the genome, they've discovered that, in fact, there's much more to heredity than just our genes. Epigenetic phenomena contribute significantly to our ultimate development, as studies on twins have demonstrated. Dr. Gehring will tell us what epigenetics is and why it is so important in biology and medical research. She'll also explain the use of a modest plant called Arabidopsis thaliana as a model for studying the mechanisms of epigenetics. Now, although we understand that all Earth life is very much related, few of us would expect the commonal commonality she's going to explain between mammals and Arabidopsis that make this plant an ideal model for the study of epigenetics. It's roughly analogous to the role of the fruit fly in earlier genetic studies. We are delighted that Dr. Gehring has agreed to reach out to the general public to discuss a very exciting area of modern science, and we're very honored to welcome her. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's great to be here this evening. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about epigenetics which many of you have probably heard this word before, before and may have been confused by it. So my talk tonight is titled Beyond the Gene, Epigenetics Revealed. On this first slide, uh, this title slide, I'm showing uh, an epigenetic phenomenon that was described in the early 1990s in Petunia. And you can see that all of these different forms here actually have the same genetic composition but you have very, very different phenotypes in terms of how these flowers are patterned. And this is called epigenetic. Epigenetics has been uh, become very um, common in the popular press. There's been uh, news magazines that have featured epigenetics. So I've put up two covers here from Time Magazine and Der Spiegel in 2010. Both of these magazines had cover stories on epigenetics where they were explaining why DNA um, isn't your destiny or victory over the genes. And I think once, once a scientific subject enters the popular press like this, uh, you really sort of know that this is something where there's a lot of interest and excitement. Now, I think many of these, um, many of the news articles you read may talk about epigenetics and they may uh, describe epigenetics in slightly different ways. And so tonight what I'd like to do is first define epigenetics. Um, so that we're all starting with a very clear definition. I'm going to talk about some examples of epigenetic phenomenon in plants and in animals. And then we'll touch a little bit on the molecular, me molecular mechanisms of epigenetics. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my own research on epigenetics and gene imprinting in plants. And finally, I'll sort of end uh, with a slide on one of the big questions in epigenetics and where does the research go from here for the future. So you're all probably familiar with genetics and the idea that the sequence of genes determine traits or how an organism looks. And so we know that um, genes are made up of the four DNA bases, A, T, C, and G. 
and each gene has a, has a sequence of these bases. This gene encodes for an, for an RNA, which will then make a protein that gives you um, the output uh, of the genome. So here in this example, if we have a trait uh, for a plant, uh, the trait here I'm showing is flowering time. And this is just a normal wild-type plant. It flowers at a certain time. And there's a gene that we know controls this trait. So if we had a mutation in this gene, here I'm depicting a, a change from the base G to A, this could cause a change in the trait that is observed. So now this gene that controls flowering time is mutated, so you get a mutant phenotype where these plants are now late flowering. So we would describe this as genetic. And I'm just going to define that as heritable changes in traits that are caused by changes in the DNA sequence. But you might also see these same traits, this, this late flowering phenotype, as we call it, if you had two genes that looked totally normal. So let's say you had a situation where you, you looked at the sequence of these genes and you found that in both, in both plants, the normal flowering plant and the late flowering plant, that they had the exact same sequence of A, T, Cs, and Gs. Yet this late flowering phenotype uh, was heritable. So in that case, we would call that an epigenetic difference. So really, we, we define epigenetics often um, uh, by the way it is different from genetics. So I'll define epigenetic as heritable changes in, in traits that are not caused by changes in the DNA sequence. And one really good way to, to remember what epigenetics means is to uh, just look at the word and think about um, the derivation of the word with, with the prefix epi meaning above. So what we're looking at really is a level of information above the level of the genes. So there are many epigenetic phenomena that have been described in, in plants, animals, uh, even in bacteria, we find epi evidence of epigenetics. And so these, it's, it's really, um, epigenetic differences can really underlie key traits for an organism. So I'm showing you three examples here. Um, where you have a plant that normally produces a flower that's uh, bilaterally symmetrical, and in an epigenetic mutant, uh, it produces a flower that has a much different pattern. It's radially symmetrical. The pigmentation of this corn here is due to an epigenetic difference. Uh, so this, this green plant and this purple plant have the exact same DNA sequence, yet you see very different traits. And again, here's an um, example from mammals with these mice. They have a gene f that uh, um, uh, codes for the color of the coat, and in each case, the gene in these mice with very different phenotypes, very different coat colors, is exactly the same. Okay. So I want to get into a little bit of, of um, how this epigenetic, where this epigenetic information is contained uh, within an organism. And one thing that's important to remember is we're all made up of a genome, which is, which is our, uh, our complete sequence of our DNA. And you're all probably familiar with the structure of DNA as a double helix. This DNA molecule isn't simply lying loose uh, in the nucleus. It's a complex um, with, with uh, proteins. And basically, the reason that the DNA has to be complex with proteins is because there's really a space issue when you compare the amount of DNA with the size of the cell that it's packaged in. So if you took the human genome and you stretched it out from end to end, it would be approximately two meters. Yet that uh, DNA has to fit into a nucleus that has a radius that's only 10 microns. So a micron is a millionth of a, of a meter. So you have, you have this um, five orders of magnitude difference between how how long the DNA is and the space that it has to fit in. And so in order for DNA to fit into this space, it has to be very tightly packed. And to do that, it's, it's wrapped around proteins called nucleosomes, which are depicted here in this figure as these uh, blue balls. And so each nucleosome, the DNA will wrap around each of those nucleosomes about two times. And so in this way, you can start to compact the DNA. And then these nucleosomes can interact with one another to form higher order uh, structures. So that for a uh, condensed chromosome here, um, you, have, you have many arrays of nucleosomes packed very tightly together.
Now, the way that DNA is packaged uh, affects its, its accessibility. So if you have DNA that's very tightly packaged, this is less accessible to the cell. It's less easily read by the cell than you, if you have DNA that's more loosely packaged. And so all of this can affect how the DNA is read. So I'm going to focus on uh, two mechanisms uh, of epigenetics. One, this DNA packaging, which I've uh, described very briefly, and the other is chemical modifications to the DNA. And these two mechanisms interact with one another so that chemical modifi modifications to the DNA, I'll be specifically talking about DNA methylation, can really affect how the DNA is packaged. So first I want to start off with one uh, example of epigenetics that's very familiar to many people, and that's the calico cat. Uh, so the cat here has, has fur that's in uh, patches of different colors. You see black patches and orange patches. And this is, in fact, due to an epigenetic difference between the cells that gives rise to those patches of fur. So one thing to note about calico cats is that uh, they're all female. Uh, and um, because they're female, the, the genetic constituent is that they uh, have two copies of the X chromosome. So um, the gene for fur color is on the X chromosome. And so one chromosome, which you get from one parent, let's say the chromosome from dad, may have the variant of this gene that gives you a black coat color whereas the chromosome from mom may have a gene, a uh, variant of this gene that gives you orange coat color. But what happens in, in females, in cats as well as in, in people, is that in each cell, only one of these X chromosomes is uh, expressed. So what happens is that one X chromosome will randomly be chosen, so either the chromosome that came from mom or the chromosome that came from dad, will randomly be chosen uh, to be inactivated. So what you'll find if you look in a cell, you can see this just by, by looking at the, the nucleus of a human cell, is that one of the X chromosomes will be in a very condensed state. So the DNA will be very tightly packaged um, with those proteins. And because the DNA is in a very condensed state, that DNA can't be accessed by the cellular machinery, so the genes that are on that particular chromosome that's inactivated are not expressed. And so what you have in these patches of, of different colored fur is that in the example I've shown here where the orange uh, copy of the gene was on the chromosome from mom, where you see an orange patch of fur, that means that it's the X chromosome from mom that is still active and the X chromosome from dad is uh, uh, compacted and silent. And so even though these cells have the exact same genetic makeup, they have the same genes, uh, those genes are being expressed in very different ways. So the black fur here um, indicates that in, the, in these cells, it was dad's X chromosome uh, that uh, is expressed and mom's that was compacted and silent. So that's really all I'm going to say about uh, packaging of the DNA and how that uh, affects the output of the genome. What I'm going to focus on for most of the talk is the impact of a chemical modification of DNA. Uh, and that's uh, a modification called DNA methylation. So cytosine, uh, which is one of the four DNA bases, which I'm showing the structure here, it can be modified by enzymes called DNA methyltransferases. And what those enzymes do is they take a methyl group, which is simply a carbon surrounded by three hydrogens, and they attach it uh, to the cytosine base. And that forms uh, a DNA base called 5-methylcytosine. These methyltransferase enzymes are conserved um, uh, through uh, pretty much all, all kingdoms of life. So you find homologous DNA methyltransferases in plants, animals, and fungi. And in general, wherever you find this modified cytosine in the DNA, this modified uh, base, that DNA tends to not be read by the cell. So the addition of methyl groups to the DNA makes the DNA, um, in many cases, silent. Uh, 
and we'll talk a little bit more about how that actually occurs. So this cytosine DNA methylation, as I alluded to, is really widespread um, uh, throughout life. So it was first discovered around uh, 1925, and then when people were isolating DNA from different organisms in the 50s, they were interested in seeing um, what the components of the DNA were in terms of the four uh, bases, A, T, C, and G. And what they found is that many of uh, the C's, the cytosines, were actually modified by methyl groups uh, uh, constituting 5-methylcytosine. So I've just listed here in different classes of organisms the amount of 5-methylcytosine that you find in the DNA. And so you have a significant uh, portion of the DNA in animals that uh, is in, that is 5-methylcytosine. And even more in plants, as shown here, you can have up to 30 percent of the cytosines being methylated. That's because we uh, whereas in mammals, um, cytosine methylation is restricted to a specific sequence context. Uh, if you have a C followed by a G in the DNA sequence, in plants we see um, methylcytosine in really all sequence contexts. Now one thing uh, that I want to point out is that not all organisms have DNA methylation in their genome. And some of the, the organisms that have been sort of the favorite of geneticists throughout the years, like yeast, and fruit flies, which uh, Yvonne mentioned, actually don't have any DNA methylation in their genome. Um, and so certainly um, uh, lack, loss of, D the absence of DNA methylation is not incompatible with life, uh, but, but really it's that these other organisms, uh, plants and many animals, have another layer of information that they use to regulate their genome. So one of the reasons that DNA methylation is such a good epigenetic mark is because, because it can be faithfully inherited after DNA replication. So here I'm depicting a strand of DNA um, with uh, the four bases, and you can see that some of these bases are methylated cytosine, which I'm depicting by uh, this little MC. Uh, so after DNA replication, the new strand of DNA will not have any methyl marks on it. But this methyltransferase enzyme can methylate the new strand based on the pattern of methylation of the parent strand. And so in this way, methylation patterns are recapit recapitulated after DNA replication and cell division. Now, um, I won't go into this in detail, but in plants, as I mentioned, we find methylation in all sequence contexts, and sometimes there's not symmetric methylation on both strands, so plants actually have an additional layer of, um, of uh, DNA methyltransferases that, that carry out this methylation. Okay. In both plants and animals, if you lose DNA methylation, that has very severe con phenotypic consequences for the organism. So on the left here is shown um, mice, wild-type mice embryos and mouse embryos that have lost almost all of their methylation. And these embryos basically arrest after 10 days of development and, and ultimately they, they die. Similarly in plants, here's a wild type plant. On the right, here's a plant that's lost almost all of its methylation. That plant is very, very tiny and stunted and is sterile. And so, so we know that, that these kinds of experiments really told researchers that DNA methylation was very important um, in, the, in the organisms where it's found for establishing uh, the growth and development of that organism. So I wanted to go back to one example of epigenetics that's really been around for hundreds of years uh, because it's kind of interesting historically. So some of you may have heard of Carl von Linnaeus, who was uh, a botanist and taxonomist who lived in the 1700s, and he basically defined many of the, uh, he classified organisms into species, and we still use uh, his taxonomic descriptions to this day. So in, in 1744, um, he was sent this specimen of toad flax, or Linaria vulgaris, that was very, very different from what he usually saw. And this is, this is uh, his drawing here on the left of that specimen. So normally this plant makes flowers that uh, are bilaterally symmetric, and they have one spike here. Uh, 
But what he found in this variant of Linaria vulgaris is that the flowers have a much different uh, morphology, and they make five of these spikes and are radially symmetrical. And this, this was very, very shocking uh, to Linnaeus at the time um, because he thought that all species uh, had been, uh, were created uh, in the beginning of time and they were invariant. And here he has a plant that its body is very normal, but its flowers are unlike anything he's ever seen on this plant. And so he said, this is certainly no less remarkable than if a cow were to give birth to a calf with a wolf's head. Um, and really, the, the study of this plant, um, actually, um, this was well before Darwin's time, but the study of this plant really um, gave rise to the concept that species could change over time. And so he called this Peloria, which is Greek for monster. Now, in the late 1990s, people decided to actually see, well, what's, what's the mutation in a gene underlying this difference in flower morphology? And so a group of researchers found that a gene called Cyclodia, or CYC, is responsible for producing flowers of the normal shape. And so they expected in this in the Peloria mutant, in this radially symmetric flower, that the gene would be mutated. But they sequenced the entire gene and didn't find any differences in uh, the, the DNA base pairs. What they found was actually there was an epi mutation, that this cyclodia gene had become methylated, so that the sequences um, five prime of a gene or the sequences upstream of a gene that control its expression were very heavily methylated, and this gene was off. And so now, even though this plant with a very different morphology has a gene that's perfectly normal in sequence, it's not being expressed uh, because of this methylation. Now, one interesting thing um, that, that uh, has been found about this uh, Peloria mutant is that you'll have a plant that gives that has these strange looking flowers that are radially symmetrical but occasionally there'll be a branch that makes a completely normal looking flowers and what this really highlights is that although epi mutations are heritable they're also less, much less stable than genetic mutations and you can occasionally have reversion of an epi phenotype and this really comes down to how well, um, how well this DNA methylation system is maintained. So if you think about um, copying the DNA, the enzymes that copy DNA after replication have a very high fidelity rate. So they'll only make a mistake once every 100 million bases. But the methyltransferase enzymes that copy the DNA methylation patterns uh, have a much lower fidelity. And so there's an error in uh, copying methylation patterns around one every 25 methyl sites. Uh, most of the time, this may not have much of an, uh, of an impact because methylated sites are really clustered together. Uh, and so if you lose one, it might be OK. But this is really the basis for, for um, this difference between genetic mutations and epi mutations is that the epi mutations are less stable. Okay. So I mentioned that this cyclodia gene um, methylation accumulated in the upstream regulatory sequences, so the sequence that control whether the gene is on or off. And so why is this methylation in these regions really inhibitory uh, to gene expression or transcription? So there's been a couple, um, a couple mechanisms that have been identified, and this is actually still very much an area of active research. So one idea is that uh, methylation in, in regulatory sequences simply blocks um, transcription factors from binding the DNA. So transcription factors are genes that control another gene's expression. Another uh, mechanism for, uh, for this effect is through proteins that actually bind the methylated DNA. So in both plants and animals, there's a class of proteins called methyl binding proteins that specifically recognize the, the cytosine uh, methylated base. They can bind that, and then 
recruit other proteins, some of which have repressive functions. And so in that way, the gene is not expressed. And finally, a third way gets back to the interaction uh, between uh, cytosine methylation and the packaging of the DNA. And it's been shown that these DNA methyltransferases can recruit other enzymes to the DNA that actually um, modify the nucleosomes, those proteins that DNA is wrapped around, in such a way that the DNA becomes more tightly compacted. So there's this very nice feedback, actually, between uh, the chemical modifications to the DNA, the methylation, and how tightly the genome is packaged in uh, nucleosome proteins. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, things you may read in the popular press about epigenetics suggest that um, you know, if you, if you eat something, um, it can change your epigenome, your diet can change your epigenome and uh, affect the progeny, your progeny, your children's progeny, et cetera. Now, personally, I think that, that probably this isn't um, something that we have to worry about too much because actually mammals have a very efficient epigenetic resetting cycle during their development. So during mammalian development, as uh, germ cells, the egg and the sperm, are being formed, the methylation of those cells is erased. And that's depicted in this diagram here. Um, if you look, uh, just pay attention here to the blue and the red lines, which depicts DNA um, from the maternal parent and the paternal parent. As egg and sperm are being formed, these cells lose methylation, and then uh, methylation patterns are reset. Now, immediately after fertilization, after the egg and sperm combine, there's another resetting of methylation. And it's thought that this really um, brings the two genomes, the genome from the mom and the genome from the dad, down to the same epigenetic state. So it's sort of the, the tabula rasa of the, of the epigenome. And uh, this, this methylation is reprogrammed so that now, um, as an embryo develops and you're differentiating different cell types, these, um, these marks are then reset. So really down here in these troughs of methylation, the cells are thought to have the potential to become any cell type. And this is actually, this methylation resetting uh, that happens during the mammalian life cycle actually has a lot of implications for things like um, the development of stem cells, uh, and um, for, for cloning. So it's known that um, the human egg and, and eggs from many other mammals really have an amazing capacity to reprogram cells, one aspect of which is removing methylation. So I just, um, I'm just highlighting here um, really how the first cloning experiment that was ever um, done worked, where basically what you can do is you can take an egg cell, uh, which has uh, its DNA in a nucleus, uh, and take a differentiated cell. In this case, it was a, a mammary gland cell. Remove the egg's DNA, so you remove its nucleus, and then put in the nucleus from a differentiated cell, fuse those together, induce this cell to divide, implant it in a surrogate, and what you get is a, is a cloned uh, cloned animal, uh, so in this case Dolly the sheep, which is the first mammal that was cloned, and this was published on in 1997. And so one area of research that um, is really exciting is actually trying to figure out what is this egg doing such that it can reprogram all the methylation in the genome so it can erase all the marks that accumulated through the life cycle of this organism so that now this nucleus doesn't remember that it came from a mammary gland, uh, and this, this uh, allows you to develop an entirely new organism from a differentiated cell. So now I just want to turn, um, after talking about those few examples in plants and animals, I want to talk a little bit uh, more about my own research on epigenetics in plants. So why are we studying epigenetics in plants? Um, there's really a lot of good reasons. Many of the epigenetic, epigenetic phenomenon were first described in plants. So I showed you that um, 
uh, Peloria mutant from, from, that was described in 1744. Of course, they didn't know it was epigenetics then. They didn't even know what a gene was. But um, really, there's a really long history of epigenetic phenomenon in plants. Um, and so we, we have a lot of um, different phenotypes and material to work with. One other point, key point, is that many, most of the epigenetic machi machinery is shared between plants and animals. So those DNA methyltransferase enzymes that put methylation on the DNA, it's um, a homologous enzyme between uh, plants and animals. So basically, uh, the last common ancestor of plants and animals shared this enzyme. Many of the other um, uh, epigenetic modification enzymes like uh, proteins that add, that modify nucleosomes are also shared between plants and animals. So a lot of the information uh, that we find from working in plants can actually be directly applied to uh, mammalian systems. Another key point is that many agriculturally important traits are actually influenced by epigenetics. One of these, which um, I've mentioned here, is flowering after cold exposure. So many of you um, who have a garden might know that there are some plants that you plant um, in the fall and then they overwinter and flower in the spring. And these plants actually have a mechanism of counting, a quantitative mechanism of counting the days of cold they've been exposed to so that they'll only flower after a certain length of cold. So this is, this is really important for plants because if you had, you want to be able to distinguish a cold snap from a winter because if you flowered after a cold snap, it could be very deleterious because now you're producing progeny in winter. And so this mechanism of counting uh, the amount of cold that a plant has been exposed to is actually epigenetic um, and is, is a very exciting area of research. So this, this is you know, important for garden plants, but it's also very important for agriculture. For example, winter wheat you plant in the, in the fall and then uh, harvest in the spring. So the plant that I work on and that uh, pretty much um, all plant biologists work on, or, or many, is called Arabidopsis thaliana. And this picture here I took um, right near the MIT campus. This is Arabidopsis in its natural habitat. It's not a glamorous plant at all. It's actually a weed. Um, so it likes growing in, in disturbed soils. You can see it here growing uh, next to the railroad tracks that go through the MIT campus. Um, but it's, it's really the, the workhorse uh, for plant biologists for a number of reasons. So I brought a couple of examples um, here. So this is um, Arabidopsis thaliana uh, that I have growing uh, back in our greenhouse uh, at the Whitehead. And as you can see, it's a very small plant. These plants, first it grows as a rosette where it makes many leaves. And then eventually, uh, after about four weeks, uh, it'll send up a, a bolt uh, and flower. So that's what this is. So these plants are really nice because they're small. Um, so you can grow a lot of them to do experiments. They're easy to grow. And um, the, really the most important thing is that um, we know the entire sequence of the genome of this plant and we have a lot of different genetic tools. So it was in the mid uh, to late 1980s that people really decided to adopt Arabidopsis thaliana as the model organism for uh, plant biology research. So whereas fruit flies are a model organism for, um, for genetics, um, mice are a model organism for much of biomedical research, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana is the model organism for plant biology research. So as I mentioned, it has a very small genome, which um, made it um, uh, really easy, well, relatively easy to sequence its entire genome. So we know the entire sequence of, of all the genes in this plant. It has a short life cycle of about two months. One key point is that um, it makes a lot of progeny, so anytime you're, you're working with a organism and you want to do genetics with that organism, you, you hope that it uh, makes a lot of progeny. Uh, so these, these uh, uh, little seed pods here contain the seeds. We call them siliques. And each plant will produce about 3,000 um, progeny. Arabidopsis thaliana is also distributed worldwide. 
And so there's a lot of genetic diversity uh, in this species and also a lot of epigenetic diversity we're finding. And so you can use natural variants of this species that are found, uh, it's found really from Sweden down to the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa. Um, you can use the diversity that's present within the species to do experiments. Another uh, feature that makes Arabidopsis very nice is that you can very easily transform it with um, foreign DNA. So you can, you can take these plants and uh, put in whatever piece of DNA you want if you want to test something about that piece of DNA. Okay. So the process, the epigenetic process that I work on is called gene imprinting. And this describes a situation where alleles of a gene are expressed differently depending on whether they're inherited from the male or the female parent. This is a phenomenon that interestingly is found in, in two classes of organisms, in mammals like us and in flowering plants like Arabidopsis. So imprinting um, is again an epigenetic phenomenon. So each diploid organism will inherit one chromosome from their mother and one chromosome from their father. And the expectation um, uh, for these genes is they should be expressed similarly um, without regard to where they came from. But for an imprinted gene, so in this example here, gene B, uh, one, uh, one copy is expressed and one copy is silent. So whereas with X inactivation, we were talking about the entire X chromosome, one being silent, here we're really now down at the level of you know, the dif differences between individual genes on chromosomes. And this is really an epigenetic phenomenon because you have two copies of a gene, one from mom, one from dad. They reside together in the same cell, in the same nucleus, yet one is expressed and one is silent. So it's, imprinting is really important um, uh, both in flowering plants and in mammals for a number of reasons. There's several, gene, um, several um, human diseases that have been identified that are associated with um, loss of imprinting or mutations in imprinted genes. I've listed a few of them here, Prader-Willi syndrome and Engelmann syndrome. And these, these can actually have very um, um, severe consequences uh, for the people that have inherited these diseases. Now one thing that's been noted for imprinted genes of both plants and animals is that um, many imprinted genes are differentially methylated depending um, on whether they came from the mom or the dad. So in, in my little example here, gene B, the copy that is not expressed might be methylated, whereas the copy that is expressed, um, it does not have methylation. So in plants, imprinting occurs in a tissue called the endosperm, uh, which I'll briefly introduce to you. So you can think of the endosperm as basically like a placenta. In this picture here of a seed, this is an Arabidopsis seed, it's stained with a dye so that you can see the different components. It's surrounded by a maternal seed coat, and inside is a little developing embryo. This embryo is about three days, three or four days old, and surrounding it is endosperm tissue. And basically the function of the endosperm is to serve as a conduit from the trans for the transfer of nutrients from the maternal parent into the seed. And so there's a lot of sugars that are moving, moving from mom into this endosperm. And then the endosperm supports the embryo during its growth and development. The embryo um, gets nutrients from the endosperm. And in a Arabidopsis seed, ultimately, um, the embryo will almost completely consume the endosperm. So imprinting appears to take place uh, in this very particular tissue in plants. And again, some of the imprinted genes that we know about are absolutely essential uh, for proper endosperm development. So I'll just mention one of these. This is a gene called uh, MEA, or Medea is its full name. And it's a gene that's only expressed from the copy that's inherited through mom. The copy that's inherited through dad is silent. So what's shown here is, um, so here on the top is just uh, wild type or uh, normal seeds developing in a Arabidopsis seed pod. But here is the results of a genetic cross. If you take a plant that's heterozygous for a mutated uh, Medea gene, so in, in Arabidopsis, um, we always write uh, normal wild type genes in capital letters and uh, mutated genes in lowercase. 
So if we take a, a plant that has one mutant copy of this gene and cross it to a wild type male, we see uh, uh, a very different phenotype. So half of the seeds look normal, so they got a normal copy from mom and a normal copy from dad. Uh, but the other half of the seeds uh, show this uh, endosperm overproliferation and ultimately seed death uh, trait. And so these seeds inherited a mutant copy from mom uh, and a wild type copy from dad. So when, when people were first describing this mutation, it was very confusing. You have a wild copy, uh, a normal copy of the gene from dad. How come these seeds are still uh, showing this, this trait? Um, and what it comes down to is that this copy from dad, even though it's perfectly normal, the sequence is perfectly fine, this gene is not expressed. And so the, the, uh, uh, the trait of the seed really depends only on what comes through mom. Okay. Now this may be the first time that you've heard the word endosperm. Um, even many biologists aren't familiar with what endosperm is. But I want to point out that this is actually a really, really important tissue. Um, and it serves as the foundation uh, of our diet. It's been estimated that 50% of the world's calories actually come from endosperm. And so where does that come from? That primarily comes from rice, from wheat, and from corn. So uh, a white rice grain is 100% endosperm. So we absolutely depend on endosperm. Without endosperm, you know, we wouldn't exist. Even, um, this is kind of a fun example that I point out, even coconut is actually endosperm. Um, so a, a coconut is a, is a big seed, and inside is a very little embryo, but most of, what's, most of the meat in a coconut is actually endosperm. And the coconut milk in the middle is endosperm that is uncellular, that, that never underwent cellular, cellularization. <laughs> So I just really briefly want to mention where endosperm comes from because it's important to understand where it comes from in order to understand the process of gene imprinting. So like the embryo, the endosperm is a product of fertilization. Plants do fertilization a little bit differently from animals. So they make eggs and sperm, uh, but in addition to eggs and sperm, they make another, um, another gamete, a female gamete, and this is a cell called the central cell. So both of these female gametes, the egg and the central cell, get fertilized. So an embryo um, uh, is a product of the fertilization of an egg by a sperm, so just like in, in uh, animals. The endosperm is a product of fertilization of this central cell with one of the sperm. So the embryo and endosperm are actually genetically identical. They're from the same uh, fertilization event, and they're developing um, together within the say, same seed, but they have a very, very different epigenetic fate. Okay. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data from my own work, uh, and really what I, what I became interested in when we realized that this imprinting process was taking plants in plants in the endosperm is, well, if we look at where all the methylation is um, uh, in the DNA of endosperm, where will we find it, and how will that compare to where all the methylation is in the embryo, which is genetically identical. So how do these two genetically identical organisms that are developing together, how do their epigenome ultimately differ? And so what we did was um, take Arabidopsis seeds and dissect them into their different component parts. So there's this big maternal seed coat, um, the embryo here, and then this endosperm tissue. And we have methods where we can isolate just the methylated fraction of the genome uh, we have an antibody to methylation, so this antibody specifically binds methylcytosine, and we can use that to pull down that methylated DNA and uh, sequence it and see what's there. So in that way, we can basically make a map of the genome where we found where all these methylated cytosines are. Now the only downside of working with Arabidopsis seeds, I've told you all the great things about Arabidopsis, the only downside is that the seeds are very small. Um, and so this is, this is an Arabidopsis seed uh, sitting on a penny there in, in Abe Lincoln's eye. And so it, it actually it takes quite a bit of patience uh, to pull apart these seeds to get enough material for our experiments. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is a sna uh, part of the, the genome of Arabidopsis and the methylation profile that we described um, in the embryo and in the endosperm. 
So what you're looking at here is just uh, in these, this blue track, uh, these blue boxes are where the genes are. So we're looking at about 10 <coughs> genes here. Um, and these two profiles in, in blue and in pink are the methylation profiles in the embryo and in the endosperm. So wherever you see a, a taller peak, that means there's more methylation there. Um, and, and as the peak gets smaller, that's less methylation. So you can see that these, these two um, different tissues, embryo and endosperm, have very, very similar methylation profiles. You can see a lot of peaks that look like they're in common. But we can find uh, regions of the genome where there's very clear differences, where these differentially methylated regions. So you can see in this example, there's uh, a big peak of methylation near this gene in the embryo, and it's lost in the endosperm. So we've done a lot of work on trying to figure out um, uh, you know, where exactly these are, what types of sequences they represent, and what the functional consequence of this is. And what we found is that if we look more closely, is that the imprinted genes, so again, genes are imprinted in the endosperm, that the, the copy of the gene that comes through mom has less methylation than the copy of the gene that comes through dad and compared to both uh, mom and dad's copies in the embryo. And that's shown here for this gene uh, MEA or Medea, which I showed you before. So if you look at this, this gene um, here in yellow, there's regions uh, upstream and downstream of the gene that are methylated. And if we look at their methylation, their percent methylation um, on the copy that comes through mom in the endosperm and compare it to the copy that comes through dad, uh, if you compare this bar here with this bar here, you can see there's much more methylation on the copy that comes through dad. Um, but in the embryo, where this gene is not imprinted, you can see both mom and dad's copy have very similar levels of DNA methylation. So what we found actually um, goes back to, to when the gametes that give rise to these different uh, tissues are being established. So we found that in this central cell, which is the female gamete, that's the, the progenitor of the endosperm, there's an enzyme, a DNA demethylase enzyme, that's expressed only in this cell, but it's not expressed in the egg cell, and it's not expressed in the sperm cells. And what this does is it establishes an, epi epi an epigenetic asymmetry uh, between the, among the gametes. So this gene is expressed specifically um, in the central cell where it removes methylation from imprinted genes so that now um, in the endosperm you have this uh, asymmetry established where the maternal copy in the endosperm is less methylated than the paternal copy. Now because this demethylase enzyme isn't expressed in the egg, um, you don't see any imprinting in the embryo. Now, one thing my lab is doing now, and I'll just mention this very briefly, is um, there's a lot of new technologies out there that you can use to look at what's happening in the entire genome, both at the DNA level and at the gene expression level. And so now we're using these technologies to identify what are all of the imprinted genes in the genome, um, what are they, and uh, uh, how does that relate uh, to their, their epigenetic marks. So we found about 200 imprinted genes in the Arabidopsis genome. That's of about, um, there's about 30,000 genes in the genome, so it's a small number. But actually many of these imprinted genes encode proteins that we think might be very interesting. Many of them uh, are transcription factors, which are genes uh, who make proteins that control the expression of other genes. And so setting up by establishing these epigenetic differences uh, and affecting transcription factors, you can actually affect many, many genes because the transcription factors control many other genes. So you really have this hierarchy being established. Okay. So I just want to um, take a moment to think about why genes might be imprinted from an evolutionary perspective because it's actually um, uh, rather strange if you think about it. We're, we're all taught that um, one advantage of having a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad, basically the advantage of sexual reproduction, is that um, if you get a bad copy from mom, maybe you have a good copy from dad, so it's compensated. 
But for an imprinted gene, that, that no longer is in the case because one copy is always silent. So if the bad copy is the one that is the express copy, now you have uh, the potential um, to have a mutant phenotype or even a, a disease. And so it's thought, well, there must be some reason that this phenomenon of imprinting is actually evolutionarily advantageous. And it's thought that it, that it may have evolved due to genetic conflict between uh, mothers and fathers. And this really applies to both uh, flowering plants and to um, uh, mammals. This is called the parental conflict or kinship theory of imprinting, and it was uh, uh, developed by David Haig at uh, Harvard University. And what it, it really relies on is if you look at where imprinting happens, um, it happens in mammals and it happens in flowering plants. And the commonality between these organisms is that in both, offspring uh, develop um, within the mother and they directly receive nutrients from the mother. So in, uh, in animals, that's through the placenta, and in plants, that's through this endosperm tissue. Now, um, the maternal parent obviously is equally related to all of her offspring, but those offspring may have different fathers. So for example, uh, in a plant where um, uh, a plant produces many ovules, that are then, uh, which is where the egg cell and the central cell are, that are then uh, fertilized by pollen, which is, contains the sperm. But this pollen, of course, you know, you see pollen flying through the air. This pollen uh, that lands on this plant could be from many different fathers. Um, and so it's in the um, interest of the father's genome to get as many resources from the mom through the endosperm or through the placenta as possible for his particular offspring. So whereas mom wants to partition her food equally among her offspring, dad wants to get the most for his offspring so that it ha so he has the highest chance of passing on his genetic material to the next generation. And so this sets up a conflict between uh, the genome from mom and the genome from dad within the offspring. And so it's thought that this might be one of the reasons for gene imprinting, that really these these genes are sort of at war with each other. And the idea, the prediction from this theory is that genes that promote nutrient transfer uh, from mom to the offspring will be expressed uh, from, from dad's genome, but genes that do the opposite will be expressed from mom's genome. And actually, if you look at many of the imprinted genes in, in mammals, this really seems to be the case. Um, and uh, additionally, in plants, we have a few examples where it looks like imprinted genes are directly controlling nutrient transfer. Okay. So I just want to finish, um, uh, that's all I'm going to say ab about my work on imprinting. I just want to finish um, thinking a little bit more broadly about what some of the big questions are in epigenetics. So I hope, I hope you'll leave here with a clear sense of what epigenetics is. Um, and these are, these are um, really where I see the field going. So we now have the ability um, with these genomics technologies to look at the entire genome and find where all the methyl marks are or all the modified nucleosomes and start to map how DNA is packaged three-dimensionally within cells. Um, but I think we really need to get more precise at this point of how is the epigenome changing during development? So as cells go from just being egg and sperm to making different cell types, how is the epigenome changing uh, during developmental transitions? And how might the epigenome be different in disease? It's actually been known for a long time that, that um, one thing that you commonly find in cancers is, in addition to mutations in genes, you also find very different DNA methylation patterns. Um, and uh, genes that, that would normally suppress the growth of tumors get methylated and are now silent. And so actually there's, there's um, a large effort to develop uh, cancer drugs, uh, drugs to treat cancer, uh, based on drugs that can modulate the epigenome. I think one really exciting question now is whether or not um, the epigenome uh, records environmental information, whether the environment impacts the epigenome. For plants, it's certainly the case that it does, because we know for this process I describe of plants sen sensing winter, 
uh, we know that that, that is an epigenetic effect and, and plants really can count how many days it's been cold. What's less clear is whether or not environmental information could be passed on to progeny. Uh, this is something that could potentially be very important for a plant. So a plant, unlike an animal, um, it's always stuck in its environment. It cannot move, um, and everything that, uh, so, so sensing the environment is very important to a plant. And so it may be that in, um, environmental information um, uh, may be recorded in the epigenome and then passed on um, to uh, future generations that would grow up uh, in the same region. Now, it's, um, I, I described in mammals, there's this um, epigenetic resetting cycle where all the methylation marks are removed um, and then reset in, during embryogenesis. But in plants, that doesn't appear to be the case. There doesn't appear to be this really large scale resetting in the embryo. And so I think it, uh, this is really one exciting area of future research as to whether or not uh, environmental inputs can impact um, the information that gets passed on to future generations. And finally, the last big question is really, can we engineer the epigenome, um, uh, for example, in terms of uh, uh, treating diseases or uh, engineering traits in plants, like making plants with bigger seeds, with more endosperm? Uh, can we engineer the epigenome um, really to, to uh, develop new traits? And I think that's going to be very challenging um, to engineer the epigenome in a very directed way, but it's something uh, that could potentially be very exciting. So with that, uh, I think I'll end there, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have about epigenetics uh, or the specifics of, of the talk. Yeah. You mentioned um, in animals that over the timeline uh, of development, decreases in the sense it drops very low mm -hmm. and yet somehow comes back. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't methylation occur?